Hey everybody, it's Eugene Lee Show and welcome to Forensics Talks. This is episode 67 and today my guest is John Lentini. Now John is a fire investigator for many decades now and he has a wealth of information and knowledge. He's one of the early people who was critical of fire investigators, their education and training, and he's been a big proponent of elevating the discipline through scientific testing and rigor. Now, John has been involved in probably thousands of cases, but he's worked specifically on a large handful of wrongful conviction cases. And those are ones that he talks about significantly because of the effect that it has on people's lives. He continues to teach, write, and do his best to educate people about the effects of bias and also using good science in fire investigations. Now, this was pre-recorded, and one of the benefits of doing that is that it frees us up from talking, and so we can stand by with you and watch the video and respond to comments and questions. So if you have any questions for John or myself or any comments, go ahead and put those into the chat window, and we'll do our best to respond. So let's get to it, and I hope that you enjoy our talk. So John, thanks so much for being here today. I appreciate your time. Sure, no problem. So I want to ask you about your background a little bit because uh, you've been doing this a very long time and uh, you have a, you, you studied, uh, or at least you have a Bachelor of Arts in Natural Sciences like chemistry, uh, physics, biology, and that sort of thing. But I'm, I'm curious about before that, as a kid, like, were you always interested in sciences? Like, what kind of a, what kind of a kid were you? Yeah, I was, I was always interested in science. Yeah, that was your thing. I was, yeah. More or less, uh, when I got out of college, um, it was uh, unfortunate timing for somebody with a uh, looking for a job as a chemist because that was 1973. That was the first Arab oil embargo, uh, and chemists live at the end of the fuel industry, so the streets were full of chemists looking for work. <laughs> and uh, I don't know what I was going to do. My my dad, who was in law enforcement, uh, first as a uh, desk sergeant in Boston, and then later as a professor of criminal justice in Akron, Ohio, he said, uh, why don't you look at forensic science? And I said, uh, okay. And, and it turns out that another fortuitous event was uh, our president at the time was trying to prove he wasn't a crook. And he was very much law and order president and gave lots of money to law enforcement. Every sheriff's department got a helicopter and every state crime laboratory got money to double or triple their staff. So there were lots and lots of jobs. And I sent out 70 resumes, um, thin as it might have been in 1973, and got lots of invitations to come and interview for jobs. So the, the one that I uh, ended up getting was uh, in Atlanta, Georgia. And I had traveled through Atlanta many times because my parents lived in Ohio and I was going to school in Florida. Um, and I, back in those days, it was, it was safe for a large male to travel on his thumb. And that's how I did it. Uh, really? <laughs> frequently, frequently. You know, once in a while I would, I would have enough money for a plane ticket, but, uh, a lot of times I'd just hitchhike or we, you know, we'd, uh, carpool some other, some other guys from college, you know, would come through and pick me up. I, I liked Atlanta and, uh, it was a, it was a very pretty city back then. It had lots of parks. Um, I, I watched it slowly deteriorate over the 28 years I was there. They got more and more crowded and the government got taken over by the right wing, mm -hmm. or at least the, the state government did. Um, but anyways, um, I started with the Georgia Crime Laboratory and they put me in the criminalistic section, which is sort of a catch all for everything that couldn't be. Uh, classified as drug analysis or toxicology or fingerprints or serology. So we had uh, hairs and fibers and paint and glass. Um, bullet matching was, was in our department. I learned how to match bullets, learned how to do fingerprints just sort of as an aside. Um, I did gunshot residue analysis, but they, they, when I first got there, they tried to teach me microscopy. And we were doing microscopic hair comparison. And I just wasn't very good at it. Uh, after, after six weeks, I said to the boss, look, I don't, I don't feel like I'm proficient enough at this to send somebody to prison based on my opinion of whether two black pubic hairs match each other. Mm -hmm. And 
he said, well, OK, John, uh, maybe you'd like to do the arson. Nobody, nobody liked doing the arson analysis. It, in those days, it involved a lot of glassware, a lot of cleaning up. It was messy. We, ju- we would just take the samples of debris and boil them. And then we would condense the vapors. And if, if there was oil in the vapors, they would float on top of the water. You could actually see it. And uh, I said, well, you know, this is classical chemistry. And I looked at it. I said, I can understand this. I can explain it. I can master this. Um, <laughs> And it turned out 40 years later, microscopic hair comparison um, was pretty much discredited right. as, as a discipline. Uh, the things that people were saying about matching hairs, was, it was just false. And uh, the FBI was training people and the FBI was saying bad things in hundreds of cases. But then they would invite people from local and state labs to come to Quantico and train so they trained thousands and thousands of people in this methodology that wasn't valid. And so there's been a lot of false conviction based on that. So I, I was happy to, to uh, leave microscopic hair comparison behind. Right. And so I was doing uh, fire debris analysis and our methodology was, was simple, but not very uh, sensitive. And so the fire marshals would bring me samples and I would, test them and say, there's nothing here, or I can't find anything. He said, damn it, John, I know there was something in there. And I was, you know, 22. I was a smart ass. I said, well, if you knew there was something in there, what'd you need me for? (laughs) And so they said, okay, smart ass, you come out to the fire scenes and you show us how to find the stuff. And I I learned very quickly what the problem was. These guys were, they were way overloaded. They would, they would get, 20 fires a week that they were supposed to look at and determine, is it an accident or is it uh, arson? Hey, yeah. uh, just a second. So just to back up for a moment, though, like they put you in the, like, did they call it the arson department? I don't know what they called it. Yeah, fire they call it the arson lab. Okay. So did they just put you in there and said, you know, you're going to learn on the job? What kind of training? Oh, they, kind of- they, there was a guy, the, the, the head of the department knew how to run the instruments. We had a gas chromatograph. Uh, and, and I knew what a gas chromatograph was from my undergraduate tra- training. And um, we would first have to separate the volatile materials from the fire debris and then shoot it into the gas chromatograph. And we were doing pattern comparison. Uh, you know, uh, the fire debris analysis discipline has has sort of skated by over the years for various reasons because it was uh, analytical chemistry. Well, yeah, kind of. Uh, you you squirt the stuff into the machine, and the machine uh, prints out a pattern for you. And this back in these days, it was uh, script chart recorders. So you just got these these lines that went up and down, and they made a pattern. Gasoline would make one pattern. Kerosene would make a different pattern. Uh, mineral spirits would make yet another pattern, and about the only other ignitable liquid we had common then was, was Gulf light charcoal starter fluid, which, which had its own kind of pattern. Um, and so we learned to do pattern recognition, mm-hmm. um, which is just now 40 some years later being made more quantitative. Um, but you were working on the, you were working on the, like the chemical side. So you're doing like the, the chemical analysis, whatever, but did, did they give you any training with respect to actually like, the fire, like get out to the fire scene, look at the, look at the fire scene or whatever. That looks like they wanted you out there at some point, but. Well, I went out there with them and they showed me what they did and how they determined where the fire started. And back then everything was very simplistic. Heat rises. So fire burns up and out. It goes, it burns up because, uh, because it's lighter than air and it goes out because it, it encounters more fuel. So it makes a V shaped pattern. And if you take a piece of paper and light it on the bottom, that's what you'll get. You'll get a, a nice V-shaped pattern. It's, it's obvious. So uh, people would explain to juries, that's how we figure out where the fire started. And then when we uh, dig around there and we find carpeting that smells like gasoline, and we put it in a can and we, we can prove that, you know, there's gasoline in the living room. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, the chemical analysis technique was only... Um, 
sensitive enough to get the get the more obvious cases. So over the next 10 years, um, there was a lot of work being done to make it more sensitive. And, and we got there. We, we finally did get there. Um, but in terms of the fire scene, it was all about, well, you find the lowest and deepest char, and that's where the fire burned the longest. And people thought that forever. There's some people that still think that. Um, what that means is it's where the fire burned the most intensely or the longest. Uh, but once a room becomes fully involved, the rules change for interpreting the damage. So is that pretty much is that pretty much how fire investigation was done back in the 70s? I mean, there was uh, like where there, you know, look at the patterns, look at the scene and then, you know, see if you can interpret, you know, there's uh, there's a pattern here or something like that. Or, or what I mean, what what training and tools did people get? They had nothing. They learned from their mentors. It was all passed down from, uh, you know, word of mouth. Mm hmm. Senior guys would teach the junior guys, and then they would get old and teach the, the new junior guys. <laughs> and these are people with high school educations. These are cops and firemen. These are people with no scientific training and very little understanding of how fire works. I mean, the, the, the ones who are firemen, you know, they say, well, I put out 200 fires or 2,000 fires, so uh, I know how to do fire investigation. Well, the, the skill sets are completely different. Mm-hmm. You know, extinguishment versus uh, investigation, completely different skill sets. One requires a knowledge of how to put out a fire and the other one requires a knowledge of how fire behaves and, and what it means when you're looking at this stuff. So one so, of the problems they had was that they had so much work that they weren't doing the physical labor that needed to be done. Uh, in a fire, if somebody pours gasoline on the floor to... Uh, to set it on fire, the obvious thing you have to do is expose the floor. And the floor is usually covered with a lot of insulation and wallboard and roofing structure. You know, if the fire burns completely down, then you're looking at other things like melted metals or crazed glass. But the whole, the whole experience was based on, is it a low burn? Because this is what people thought, fire burns up and out and if it burns down, that means it must have had help in the form of a flammable liquid. Mm -hmm. um, true enough, if the fire doesn't fully involve the room. But once the fire fully involves the room, you can only have burning on the floor. Um, you know, most kids learn, you know, if you're in a fire, you get down on the floor because that's where the fresh air is. Well, fire can't burn unless it has air. And so if the room's full of smoke, it can be hot up there, but you won't have any flames up there. And all your burning is going to happen on the floor. The mm -hmm. smoke and the heat will go out the top of a window or out the top of a door. That creates a vacuum and it sucks in fresh air, fresh air at the bottom. Well, I want to get to some of these points you're making here, but I'm, I'm interested in you, though. I'm interested in at what point, because you've been very vocal about this whole area. And for a long time, I mean, you you were one of the people that are sort of blazing a path at the beginning uh, and probably... Um, probably getting some people upset along the way too, but um, you know, just saying at some point you said, Hey, there's something we got to do more here. There's a problem here or whatever. So when, when did you start to really, you know, sort of a light bulb went on or something changed, changed or shifted for you? When did that happen? On, um, I, I knew that some of these state fire marshals, they were, they were nice, dedicated public servants, but they, they weren't real sharp. Um, in some fire departments, the, the investigators were there for punishment duty, or they were there because they got injured on the job and could no longer do the rigorous work of extinguishment. Um, and a lot of people would, would become fire investigators, uh, you know, as a stepping stone on their way up to being a captain or a chief. And so they would, they would be investigators for a year or two and not get a lot of experience. Mm -hmm. And they had learned a lot of false stuff. And the first one that, that caught my my, my eye was um, crazed glass. This is something that happens uh, to glass when it's uh, overheated and it gets wet. It cracks. Well, people thought that crazed glass meant rapid heating. And I knew that that was BS, bad science, uh, because uh, of my experience with my little sister who was in the brownies and she came home and they, she made a fried marbles. They would take these glass cat's eye marbles 
put them in a cast iron pan, heat them up, and then pour water on them. And, and they were called fried marbles. I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> okay. And I had, I had the experience as, as a chemist, you know, doing uh, labs. If the experiment gets overheated, well, one way to cool it off is to put some, put some water on it. Well, I, that's almost guaranteed to break the glass. Mm -hmm. And so I knew that this crazed glass thing was, was false. Right, right. What what other uh, what other old truths have been disproven since uh, since the early days? Oh, just about all of them. Uh, oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> it used to be that uh, people would uh, find melted steel in a fire scene, and they say that means it got too hot, and it was stuck in the minds of fire investigators and even brilliant scientists that if the fire is really, really hot. That means it must have been accelerated. It's not true. It, wood and gasoline burn at essentially the same flame temperature. Um, they Gasoline will burn faster, but it won't burn any hotter. So people would find melted bed springs. And they say, ah, melted bed springs. This, this is a really hot fire. must have been accelerated. And sometimes that's all you've got. I mean, you've you got the melted bed springs in a pile of ashes. But you're not even seeing patterns. And so that was that's a really the underlying myth is that um, high temperatures mean it's accelerated. It, it doesn't mean that it means it's well ventilated. So you can you get the same temperature depending on ventilation. And if you think about it, people have known this for millennia. When a when a blacksmith wants his forge to get hotter, he doesn't change the fuel. He blows on it. Right. This is the bellows. And this somehow escaped uh, the knowledge of fire investigators for many years, for until this century, really. I mean, we always talked about the fire triangle, uh, fuel and air and an ignition source or a heat source. And you got to have all three of those in order to have a fire. But people always say, well, there's always plenty of air. It comes from the atmosphere which is fine if you're talking about a campfire or a brush fire or a trash fire, the kind of fires that everybody knows about. So everybody thinks they know about fires. But if you go into a structure and you light a chair on fire, for example, the uh, fire, the heat will go up and out, but then it hits the ceiling mm -hmm. and it can't go up anymore. So it starts piling up. It's like uh, filling up an upside down bathtub and that layer gets thicker and hotter until it reaches a certain point, somewhere around 1200 degrees Fahrenheit. And at that point, that black hot gas layer is radiating enough heat downward to light everything in the room on fire. And that'll burn the floor. Well, that was lesson number one from uh, learning about flashover. Lesson number two is when it happens, it uses up all the oxygen in the room. And this is something that was just lost on people uh, for many years. Uh, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms is, uh, they're the leading uh, agency that, that does fire investigation and fire research in this country. And uh, they know their stuff. Uh, they ran this course down in uh, the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center in Glencoe, Georgia. And they would invite fire investigators to take this advanced course. And so the government has selected these people um, and they, you know, it makes them think they're, they're hot stuff. Government flies you in to, uh, to Savannah and then puts you up in a, in nice digs and you go out to nice restaurants with, with, with your buddies, <laughs> walk stories. And it's, it's a great school. But what they did was a, a learning exercise at the beginning of each course, and they would have fires of known origin. Where they said it, they they knew what they did. And they videotaped it. Then, uh, after they put the fire out, they would ask their investigators, their students who thought they were hot stuff, to go in there and figure out where the fire started and what caused it. And they were they were asked to write down the origin and cause of the fire and submit it anonymously. So nobody's, nobody's name was on it and no records were kept. 
Um, and then they would show them the video of the fire. And this was this was designed really to break their spirit. It's kind of like, mm -hmm. you know, the, the first thing you got to do is knock a lot of these notions out of their heads. And so eight to 10 percent of the people to win this exercise got it correct. Did you say eight to, to 10? <coughs> Excuse me. Yes. Eight to 10. Um, this is. um Kind of, a, it was a well-kept secret. I knew about it because I had friends in the ATF um, and I was studying fires and publishing. Um, and and I, I found out about this and I actually printed it in the first edition of my book that there is sort of this proficiency test. And the results aren't great. Well, in 2005, there were three ATF agents said, it's time to broaden the field here. And they decided to conduct a similar exercise at a fire investigation seminar in Las Vegas. They built two bedrooms, furnished them, lit them on fire, let them burn for two minutes after flashover occurred, and then um, put them out, asked 53 fire investigators to go in this room, don't touch anything, just look at the fire patterns and tell me what quadrant the fire started in, all right? Now, what, what quadrant? So you could pick it at random, and your odds of getting it right are one in four, right? So not even the location, specific location, just this corner, that corner, that corner, yep. that corner, right? Okay. Now, which quadrant? Yeah. And more than 90% of the people got it wrong. They picked the wrong quadrant. There was this uh, BADP. Big ass burn pattern uh, in the bedroom directly across from the open door. And that's where everybody or the majority of fire investigators said this is where it started. And it turns out there was a small burn pattern around the real origin that was still visible, but it was small. And people went for the lowest and deepest char. And so people started uh, trying to understand what was going on. Uh, the word got out. It was no longer a secret. Uh, a guy named Steve Carmen, uh, who was recently retired. It was right around his retirement. So he began teaching lectures saying, look, guys, we're doing it wrong here. We're going to get the wrong origin if the room is fully involved. <coughs> Basically stating that when you have flashover and post flashover burning, the direction of the fire is going to be entirely controlled by the amount of air available. Mm -hmm. Just for the benefit of the people who are listening, uh, John, could, could you just explain what's what happens with flashover? I mean, I, I think I understand what it is, but if you can just describe okay. what's actually happening. Well, a video I can share with you. Uh, it lasts two minutes. Uh, and, and I think um, you might, like to see it, but that's hard to do on a radio. So um, remember, I was talking about how the, the heat rises and mm -hmm. it's a hot gas layer. Flashover is what occurs when that hot gas layer is hot enough to light everything in the room on fire. So you make a transition from a fire in a room to a room on fire. Right. And once that happens, Oxygen controls everything. Uh, radiation becomes the, the dominant means of heat transfer. And the place where the fire is going to be located is where there is oxygen. From a, from a, a victim standpoint, like people who are trapped in a room or something like that, what's the most dangerous component of, of a fire? Is it the smoke? Is it before flashover? What, what is the, uh, the main issue that kills them? Well, the smoke is what kills them. Mm -hmm. Usually, um, there are not that many people die from the, the thermal insult. Uh, that that usually happens after they're dead. Um, but the fire has used used up all the oxygen above knee 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 height, and so that's why they teach you: you get down on your knees and you know crawl out of there. Right. But if you're still in the room when it flashes over. It doesn't matter. You're going to die. One of the things that I heard you say too is that um, it's easier to tell. The, like the origin and cause 
um, before flashover or earlier in the in the fire. But once flashover happens, then it's more difficult. Is that a, is that fair to say? Oh, absolutely. And the longer the fire burns after flashover, flashover is a transition point. It only lasts for a few seconds. Um, the longer it burns, the less likely fire investigators are to be able to correctly determine it. So the ATF ran another test in 2007 in Oklahoma City. They ran th three fires. One of them burned for 30 seconds beyond flashover. One burned for 70 seconds beyond flashover. And one burned for th three minutes beyond flashover. Um, in some big cities, the fire department will get there within three minutes of flashover. But most fires, big fires, uh, they burn for tens of minutes after flashover. But these guys, when they, they were asked to determine the quadrant, again, they did the same experiment uh, for the 30 second beyond flashover fires, like 85% got it right, 84% got it right. The second fire, there were uh, a number of the people, six of them, they just said, I can't tell. All right. Uh, the origin is undetermined. But of the 64 who guessed, um, it was like 69 percent got it right. And then on a third fire, three minutes beyond flashover. 25 percent got it right. Now, there were 17 people had a good sense to say, I can't tell. Right. So we got back to this magic number 53 again. Um, and, you know, of the 53, 13 got it right. It's 25 percent. No better than chance. Yeah. And, and to this day, nobody has conducted an exercise like this that demonstrates that the core competency of fire investigators, that is determining the origin, uh, is, is even valid. I mean, there are things you can do, but if you're just reading fire patterns to figure out where the fire started in a fully involved room, um, it's, it's not valid. Well, yeah, I wanted to ask you also about uh, chemicals, because um, a lot of this, I mean, if somebody's, you know, getting charged with arson or something like that, then a lot of times, you know, they'll may, they may say, hey, well, they were using gasoline, they were using alcohol, they were using all this other stuff. And I saw a test you did actually online where you're taking the, uh, the Captain Morgan rum and you pour it on the on a hot burner, uh, like electrical burner on a stove and you, you trying it, trying it, and it, it doesn't flash. It doesn't, it doesn't catch on fire. Yeah. And so uh, you almost looked like you were trying to make a point because you kept trying, you know, here, here, just try it again. Let's try it again. And it didn't happen. So right. can you talk to me a little bit about some of the chemicals that are used and how, <laughs> uh, how difficult or how uh, easy they are to detect after a fire? Oh, it's, it's pretty easy to detect them. Uh, we can now detect a 500th of a drop of gasoline in a gallon sized container of debris. And that's without working up a sweat. Uh, the, the, the technology for detecting ignitable liquids has gotten very, very sensitive uh, up to the point where it might be too sensitive in some cases. Mm. For example, I can find medium petroleum distillate, mineral spirits, paint thinner, on hardwood floors 25 years after they've been finished with polyurethane finish <laughs> because the solvent gets trapped and there's not much left, but there's enough that I can detect it using the very simple techniques that we have now. Uh, all, all they do is hang a uh, carbon strip, a little piece of uh, carbon impregnated Teflon little black square, you hang that in a can, you put the lid back on, you heat the can up overnight to like you know, 180 degrees F, and all the volatile materials will evaporate, they'll be in the air inside that can, and that, that little carbon strip is gonna grab those molecules. And then in the morning, you take the carbon strip out, you dunk it in a solvent, you shoot some of that solvent into the instrument and voila, it will tell you what it was. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we have to be very careful about uh, 
saying, oh, well, we, we found ga- uh, mineral spirits in your living room. Because that doesn't really mean anything if it's a hardwood floor. Now, gasoline is uh, also easy to detect. It's pretty distinctive. And if any of it remains after the fire, um, we can detect it. What about alcohols? Alcohols, they go away. Mm -hmm. Alcohols make crummy accelerants. Uh, They don't don't burn as hot as uh, as gasoline. And all, all of the flammable liquids, what they do... Um, they burn it as vapors. So you put a flammable liquid on a floor, it's going to be gone usually within a few minutes. Uh, if it's a, a tile floor or a hardwood floor, it'll be gone in 60 seconds. If it's a carpeted floor, it'll be gone in uh, five minutes or so. Okay. You, you know, not enough time to burn a hole in a floor. And people for years thought, oh, there's a hole in the floor. It must have been caused by a flammable liquid. Um, what it really was caused by is more likely melted plastic. And melted plastic will hang around a lot longer than uh, than, a, than a flammable liquid. So the time that the fuel is burning is, is very important. The whole point of using the flammable liquid is to light more things on fire than would ordinarily catch on fire with a normal spread. Okay. And well, I want to get to some of the cases, but before I do that, I'm, I'm interested in um, like there's the National Fire Protection Association. There's the ATF you talked about as well. And um, there's a, there's a paper or a, a, you published a little paper that was the, the invisible but deadly re- reliability challenge for fire investigators. And um, there you talk about the NFPA and you talk about um, how there was an early call for testing and more scientific rigor. Who were, who were some of the first people to call out, um, you know, for some of this more testing and to be more scientific? Uh, this was this was the NFPA, uh, also people at the National Bureau of Standards, later to be called the National Institute of Standards and Technology and American electrical manufacturers. Uh, in particular, uh, what what happened was if people couldn't figure out a fire, they would say, oh, it must be electrical. And then the insurance company would turn around and sue an appliance manufacturer or an electrician. And the NFPA, uh, which has been around for uh, well over 100 years and makes all kinds of rules about fires, decided in 1985 that they were going to convene a technical committee to write a guide for fire and explosion investigations. And they did. Uh, It took until 1992 before their first document came out, and it's called NFPA 921. And that's pretty much the Bible, although people will say, oh, it's only a guide. Uh, And it is. It's a guide. But if somebody says it's only a guide, that usually means that there's something in it that they didn't agree with. Mm-hmm. Uh, they say, oh, low burning, or here's an irregular pattern must have been caused by a flammable liquid when that is strictly verboten without a laboratory confirmation. Or I can't find any accidental causes, therefore it must be arson. That's called negative corpus. Also, that's in the standard. It says, don't do that. Bad <laughs> sign. So we've got that. We've also got another document about the qualifications of fire investigators called NFPA 1033. And this that was the subject of the uh, the paper that I wrote. Uh, NFPA 1033 lists those uh, subject matter areas that a fire investigator should be current in in order to be qualified. Well, unfortunately, maybe half of the people doing fire investigation these days can't tell you what the basic units of energy are or the basic units of power or the difference between energy and power. And if you ask them what radiant heat flux is, they're like a deer in the headlights. They (laughs) don't know. And and this is, yeah, this is awful. And so the reason this is an invisible uh, challenge is that if this comes out before trial, that a guy doesn't know the basic units of energy um, or can't can't describe the combustion of hydrogen. Um, the lawyer is not going to want to put this guy on the witness chair because he's going to look stupid. I was in a trial one time where the fire marshal 
was unable to explain the combustion of hydrogen. And I had fed the question to the lawyer and said, what happens when, when hydrogen burns? Didn't know. And the judge, the judge, without being asked, just said, I'm sorry. If you don't know H2O, you will not be rendering opinion testimony in my courtroom. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's important. And, and uh, were there, I mean, I don't know when that happened, but... I, w I wanted to ask you about the 2009 NAS report and what impact that may have had on the whole fire investigation area. That was very good. Um, I had written to the, uh, the committee that was of the NAS that was putting that report together. And it was on, they did it on all forensic science. And, and I wrote to them, I said, every time one of these reports has come out in the past, you've left out fire investigation. Please don't do that. And so they invited me to come testify during one of their hearings in 2007. And I told them uh, you know, the short version of what I'm telling you. I had like 15 minutes. But the fact that they wrote anything in that report meant that there would be money from the Justice Department to do research. Mm -hmm. And there have been millions of dollars uh, flowing from the Justice Department to outfits like underwriters, laboratories, or uh, combustion science and engineering, or Jensen Hughes Associates, you know, private companies to do research on government grants. And there's been some tremendous uh, research that, that has been done as a result of that report. So 2009, it took until 2014 before there was much uh, money that was cut loose and people just couldn't figure out how to respond to it. I was at a forensic science meeting uh, the day that report came out and I just sat back and watched heads explode all over the place. And they yeah. thought they had bad things about forensic science. And the problem is that there's a lot of, a lot of the forensic sciences don't have any private sector uh, utility. Uh, paternity testing. Yeah. And so that DNA works good for that. Um, but fingerprints, there's no money in fingerprints. Right. Um, there's no money in matching bullets, but there is money in fire investigation because of the insurance market. Mm -hmm. And there always has been. Uh, so it, fire investigation is one of the uh, forensic science disciplines that did have uh, some, some monetary support, which is how we, we did the research and wrote the standards in the late 80s and early 90s. So I've always been a, a big proponent of standards so that everybody's doing the same thing. Uh, we can compare each other's work. I can look at another laboratory's work. Uh, laboratory. And speaking the same language, too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's, you know, the, kind of the problem with, with the people that are out in the field doing fire investigation. They don't have a clue. Uh, how to do chemical analysis. They don't understand chemistry and physics. And yet every day we ask them to make sophisticated decisions about chemistry and physics. Mm -hmm. so, so how, well, so, so then how has this whole area of fire investigation, there obviously have been, excuse me, some testing, there's been more testing, there's, there's more um, uh, training, there's a lot of courses now. I mean, you offer courses, you do training and stuff like that. So what would you say about the state of where things are today and are there still problems today or have a lot of is it all been corrected well it's never all going to be corrected um there are still problems today and there are still people that are not qualified doing the work but things are so much better than they were 20 years ago I mean, tremendously better and everyone who you know has entered the field since the year 2000 um nfpa 921 has been a fact of life for them and NFPA 921 says, do science, you know, no more witchcraft. And before 2000, uh, like the, the time period from 1992 to 2000, about half of the fire investigators thought NFPA 921 was, was a gift from Satan, you know, designed to let the, let the arsonist run free. Uh, not true, but, you know, we, we, we didn't want to be convicting innocent people. We didn't want innocent people to be denied their insurance claims 
because uh, some Yahoo that didn't know what he was doing said, oh, I see a low burn there. That must be where it started. And there's no accidental cause there. So must be arson. And the insurance company goes ahead and they, they, they say, well, if, if we got an expert that says it's arson, then we don't have to pay. Mm -hmm. And I, there's still some of that going on. I mean, I did as recently as, as uh, last year, um, case yeah. I was on, they, they did, they did a really, um, poor job of excavating the fire and they, they excavated like two by two feet uh, when they should have excavated a whole room and I excavated the room. Um, I was too old to be excavating the room, but I did anyways. Yeah, and I found all kinds of things that could have started the fire that these first guys had no clue were even there. So, you know, when my report came out, uh, the insurance company decided that they did not want to put this in front of a jury and they, they settled the case. Mm -hmm. uh, but but there's, there's a lot of old cases now that are, you know, I, I wrote about one last month and in the Claude Garrett case. Uh, that poor guy did 30 years based on some fire investigators statement at a jury that he could tell by looking at the floor that there were flammable liquids there. Right. Yeah. Well, I want to ask you about some of the cases because that's, that's kind of interesting. And um, I've seen some of your presentations and there is a long list of people who were um, sort of exonerated or at least let go after, you know, many years in prison and, and that sort of thing. And I'm just wondering um, well, let's let's talk about uh, I want to get one out of the way because it's uh, the one you talk about a lot, which is the Todd Willington uh, case um, or Willingham, excuse me. And that one was um, well, he was executed in 2004 for arson and his three children had died. And this is going back to like 1991. Um, so what can you what can you tell me about some of the details in that case? Like what what got him into trouble? He was a jerk. <laughs> a lot of these people are not model citizens. Um, Todd liked to play darts and drink beer. Um, he never abused his children, though. He, he never abused his wife. But he liked to play darts and drink beer. And I think he had a burglary conviction somewhere. Um, people thought that he uh, didn't act appropriately when... Uh, when the fire happened, actually, they had to handcuff him to the fire engine to keep him from going into the house to save his children. It, it wouldn't have done any good. Um, and then after the firemen, uh, fire investigators, two guys who just didn't know what they were doing, they looked at the floor and they saw poor patterns. And then, you know, at, at some point they said, oh, this looks like a cross burned on the floor. And he had a an Iron Maiden poster up on his wall. So he was a Satan worshiper. I mean, all kinds of irrelevant stuff was used to, um, to convict him. But, you know, the jury didn't like him. He had ruined Christmas. His wife, his wife was out Christmas shopping, like on December 23rd. Mm -hmm. um, but I want to make clear that I never heard of Cameron Todd Willingham until uh, after he was dead. Oh, really? OK. Uh, if, if I if I had met him before his trial, uh, there might have been a different outcome. I'd like to think there would have been. OK. Uh, who knows? And, yeah. And so can you talk to me about what happened after? I mean, after he was, uh, um, you know, executed at some point in the future, somebody took a second look at his case. And so was it just uh, I mean, it was yourself. Were there other people that were looking at this and, and just said, hey, we, there's some big problems here and. There's, there's no way he did it. What, what, what happened there? Well, what happened was I was teaching a course to public, to uh, criminal defense lawyers in San Antonio. And I get a call in my hotel room and it's Barry Sheck from the Innocence Project. And he says, uh, meet me in the bar. I'll buy you a drink. And uh, somebody had told him that that would probably a good way to get me to come <laughs> to the bar. And he tells him, he tells me about this, two cases in Texas. Uh, one was uh, the Willingham case, and another one happened about the same time with some of the same investigators uh, called Ernest Willis. And in 2004, Mr. Willis got a new trial because of 
prosecutorial misconduct. They had drugged him. He was he was freaked out that he was being tried for something he didn't do, and he was going to get sent to death row. And and he spent 19 years on death row. Um, but during his trial, they drugged him so that he's sitting there and and not not making any racket, and he's just sort of an impassive killer. And that was that was a closing argument. Look at this impassive killer. He's sitting here not showing any emotion at all. Well, neither the judge nor the jury knew that he had been drugged. And I'm talking serious, you know, antipsychotic drugs. Yeah. And when the judge found out about that 19 years later, he said, man, get a new trial. And in the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals, uh, which is actually the initials are TCCA, and it's Texas Court of Conviction Affirmation. Um, they said, no, he doesn't get a new trial. Not enough evidence. Um, and he got to a federal judge and a federal judge said, no, this is nuts. You know, He gets a new trial. And then the new prosecutor came in and looked at the evidence uh, and he had a report from a a guy named Gerald Hurst, who uh, was a good friend and mentor. Um, and Gerald Hurst said, this is not arson. This is, this is some low burning. Doesn't mean anything. And uh, the prosecutor said, you know what? I think we got an innocent man on death row. And Ernest Willis was released uh, in 2004, in the same year that Todd Willingham was exonerated. Uh, Willingham had... Uh, a corrupt prosecutor who used a lying jailhouse snitch um, to uh, tell the jury that Todd had confessed to him. Uh, and then the snitch said, no, I didn't do that. You know, I, I said that because they were promising me a better deal on my armed robbery conviction. Mm -hmm. uh, and he went back and forth. Sorry, so, did you say it was 2004 or 2014? <clears throat> 2004 is when Willingham was executed. And Willis was exonerated. I see. Okay. Okay. And so Barry asked me to look at both of those cases because we had essentially the same evidence, low burning and irregular patterns on the floor um, with completely different outcome, one exoneration, one execution. And I told Barry, I said, I'm not going to go up against the state of Texas by myself. I need to be able to recruit some help. And so I did. Uh, and I recruited some top people in the field and a top um, arson lawyer, a top fire litigation lawyer uh, to keep us out of legal trouble, you know. And so the five of us issued this report in 2006, uh, and it became the first complaint lodged with the Texas Forensic Science Commission. I was just going to ask you about the, the, the commission there, because they've been very active in many different areas and many different types of cases and different types of forensic disciplines. So they what, have role, yeah, what role have they played? Leadership. They have excellent leadership there. And, and the reason is that there's only two lawyers out of uh, nine people on the commission. There's seven scientists. So the scientists run the show. And you know, in 2009, um, they got the case. They, they, they got our complaint in 2006 and the Texas legislature in their wisdom had established a commission, appointed commissioners. Uh, they were appointed by the governor mainly, um, but they didn't fund it. So this, this commission exists, but doesn't have any money to do anything. Uh, they finally got the funding in 2008 and, and they hired uh, Dr. Craig Byler to work for them and to look at our report and, our report from the Innocence Project said, well, you know, this is just a sad uh, result of not having well-trained people. And we, we tried to, you know, downplay any evil on any park. We didn't know about the, the jailhouse snitch uh, at that time. Mm -hmm. and we, we just didn't, we didn't pay attention to the jailhouse snitch. We were looking at the physical evidence. And... Um, Dr. Byler comes in and he just, he just ripped him up. I mean, he said the, the fire investigators were like psychics and mystics <laughs> when they talked to the jury. And 
So he was getting ready to make his report to the Texas Forensic Science Commission in uh, the early fall of 2009, um, about the time um, the governor, Rick Perry, was running for president or thinking about it. And it would be really embarrassing if the commission found that in Texas had in- executed an innocent man on Rick Perry's watch. Mm-hmm. He got a, he got a, a report from Gerald Hurst uh, about a month before Willingham was executed, just asking him to step in and give him 30 days. And that's, that's all a governor can do in Texas. A governor can't really do a reprieve uh, other than the, the 30 days. And so um, Perry fired uh, several of the commissioners, including the chairman, three days before they were scheduled to meet. I mean, Dr. Byler had already bought his plane ticket to go to Austin and make his presentation. And he, they put a guy named John Bradley uh, in charge of the commission. And Bradley's goal was to uphold the Willingham conviction. He, he hated Barry Sheck's guts. Um, Barry showed up at all of the meetings and they get in shouting matches. It was, it was more than a year later that uh, Dr. Byler was actually able to give his presentation. The fire marshal wrote a letter uh, standing by his findings. And I wrote a letter to them and I said, really, this fire marshal is, is trying to mislead you. And being that there were so many scientists on the commission, uh, that they got it. Mm. So when they finally got around to writing their report, it was April of 2011. So we're talking five years after the, they got the complaint. Uh, and by then, the attorney general said, oh, you don't have jurisdiction over cases that happened before 2005 when the legislature brought you into existence, which is, you know, it's kind of a stretch. But they were not allowed to render an opinion on the Willingham case. And in, instead, they they did a very good thing. They said, well, here are our recommendations for fire investigations going forward. And they, they wrote a very good report. Um, but it didn't do Mr. Willingham any good. Um, after that, um, uh, a judge, uh, Charlie Baird in Austin decides he's going to hold a court of inquiry and he had all but, uh, written the exoneration. In fact, he had written an exoneration of Mr. Willingham, a postmortem ex- exoneration. Uh, but the third circuit court of appeals jumped in and said, don't do it, Charlie. And so he didn't hit send. Mm. But I have a copy of the order that he wrote. No, oh, really? Yeah, yeah. So he was prepared to do it. So obviously, yeah. Yeah. But the, the state didn't participate in the court of inquiry. They said this is not legal. Yeah. Kind of like a certain congressional committee. Was one of the early problems, uh, because a lot of these cases um, go back, you know, 15, 20, 30, 40, even 40 years or more, maybe. But um was it just hard to find an opposing expert at that time? I mean, how, how, I guess there were problems obviously with the, the discipline and, and how it was taught and the science, but uh, also like opposing experts and, and that sort of thing. How easy was it to find people that would go against, you not, know? Uh, it was not easy. And, and here's why um, the insurance industry runs the fire investigation business. Mm-hmm. If the insurance adjusters don't call you up and ask you to investigate the fire, then you have no business. You have no work. Your kids don't eat or don't go to college. Uh, so there's a vested interest in not getting the insurance industry upset with you. So if you take a case against a state fire marshal, the fire marshal is going to be upset with you. <clears throat> and fire marshals and insurance companies have to cooperate with each other. They're, they're supposed to run... Uh, independent parallel investigation, but they share a lot of information. And if the fire marshal gets upset with an insurance company, then the insurance company is not happy. So all the fire marshal had to say is to go to one of my clients and say, John took a case against me. And that's all he has to say. And then the next thing I know, that insurance company is no longer calling me up. Right. (laughs) But 
by the time I was uh, going against fire marshals, I, my business had actually migrated from arson cases to product liability cases, subrogation cases that were actually way more lucrative, uh, way more interesting. I mean, arson is it's a pretty mundane sort of a crime, and it's not that hard to figure out. I and mean, it's so it a lot of times uh, arson will just come up and bite you on the butt. You know, you, you got puddles of gasoline in the living room. You got ignition devices in the bedroom closet. You got fires that start in three or four places at once. It's just not that difficult. Right. Most of the time. Now, if you reduce the house to powder, uh, yeah, it becomes hard. Yeah. Um, let me ask you about your book, because, uh, you know, in terms of education and learning and that sort of thing, you have one here, uh, Scientific Protocols for Fire Investigation. When did you first put the book together? Uh, about 2002. Uh, by that time, I was going around uh, doing a, a fair number of seminars, um, giving lectures on, on different subjects in fire investigation. And um, the first chapter about fire and science uh, came about when I was working on a case uh, out of Florida where the International Association of Arson Investigators, the largest professional fire investigation body in the world, in 1997, they had written uh, an amicus brief in a case out of Florida that said fire investigators should not be subject to uh, reliability challenges because fire investigation is a less scientific uh, forensic science discipline. <laughs> and my head exploded when I saw that. And I wrote, I wrote an amicus brief of my own, which eventually morphed into chapter one. And then I had a whole lot of war stories that I had gathered. I had also studied mythology. And uh, my wife said to me, you got enough to write your book. Go for it. And I said, OK. <laughs> and so I did. Now, it took me two years uh, to get the manuscript on. But it was um, the, the first book in full color. My, my editor had said, my publisher had said, We'll give you eight pages of color photos in the middle of the book. And that was typical of the time. And when I got the manuscript done, they said, well, you need to tell us which of these pictures you want in color. And I said, you know, that's so tacky. If 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 we're not if we're going to go black and white, let's just go black and white. Right. And the editor said, uh, do you think people would pay an extra 20 or 30 percent if it was all in color? And I said, hell, yes. And so it was the first fire investigation book in full color and people loved it. And Excellent. so now all fire investigation books are in full color. <laughs> you know, that's, that's one of my, uh, one of my major contributions to the field. You also have a lot of uh, newsletters and a lot of, you do quite a bit of writing actually. So I want to point this out for people. Uh, if you head over to uh, the firescientist.com and scroll down from the homepage, uh, you'll pass by the book. And then there's like a newsletter archive and there's a, there's a bunch of uh, articles here and a lot more at the bottom. So if you just go and hit on see more. Um, there's, there's one in particular that I want to talk to you about and that has to do with uh, contextual bias. And that's one, um, I don't remember the date where you written it, but it's contextual bias in fire investigations, scientific versus, uh, versus investigative data. And um, I'm wondering about when you first wrote that and what, uh, what, what prompted you to do that? Um, this was right after the 2009 um, National Academy of Sciences report came out. Uh, they talked about contextual bias, confirmation bias in, in all forensic sciences. And I was concerned that some people uh, in the fire investigation business were going into the scene with a uh, preconceived notion based on something that had nothing to do with the behavior of fire. It would be Somebody said, oh, this guy uh, had a fight with his wife the night before or the house is for sale. So what about that? He decided to sell it to the insurance company. So we've got this uh, concept of the totality of the evidence. Well, that is what the jury looks at. That is what the jury looks at is the totality of the evidence. 
But what a fire investigator looks at, uh, if he's going to look at the totality of the evidence, it's got to be done in a certain order. Okay. The first thing to do is look at the scene and, and see what that scene tells you. You know, what is the physical evidence and what can you deduce from the physical evidence? Only after you have made a determination that the fire is intentionally set, is it appropriate to start looking for suspects? Like who had a motive to do this? Um, a, a, everybody's got a motive to rob a bank, right? But we don't do it. Um, <laughs> and, and the people, I've, I've run into a lot of people who their first time they're being accused of a crime, you know, they're in their 50s or 60s. They've raised their children, uh, never had more than a parking ticket in their lives. And all of a sudden they're looking at a, at a 50 or 60 year felony for lighting their house on fire to defraud the insurance company. Um, yeah, and I've had cases where people go in and they say, oh, the, uh, the contents aren't there that the guy said was supposed to be there. Oh, well, which content are you talking about? Well, shoes and clothing and stuff that burns up in a fire. Yeah, sometimes that stuff disappears. Or, you know, there's people that take their guns out. Uh, you know, I go to a fire scene. I did this a lot. You know, I always look for the guns. Uh, I asked the homeowner, where are your guns? And he'd tell me, and I'd look there. i think, you know, I don't see any guns here. Well, they must have burned up. Uh, no, that didn't happen. Well, somebody must have stolen them. Uh, and set the house on fire. And that that was pretty common. Right. And so was that uh, was some of that? Is that what made its way into this other paper that you wrote here, a model for confronting fire investigation errors? Um, this is is more of a challenge to qualifications more than anything. I mean, certainly the first thing you challenge is a qualification because there are so many fire investigators out there who cannot tell you what the basic units of energy are, or what is radiant heat flux, and how is it measured? What are the units of radiant heat flux? And, you know, if, if they can tell you right off the bat that it's kilowatts per square meter, you can move on. They probably know their stuff. But um, if they don't know that, then you go back and see how just how the, you plumb the, depth, the depths of their ignorance. And I've heard you say that, you know, uh, one of the first questions you have to ask, and sort of the, it's the sort of stop is, uh, you know, is it really an arson fire? And if, if it's, you know, if it's not, then you have to stop there and stop trying to move forward from there. Yep. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. And this is something that you're sort of proposing that people, you know, in law start, start looking at or start doing. People have been doing this for about 10 years now, uh, using an FPA 1033 and it's, it's list of subject matters that you're supposed to know off the top of your head. Um, and it's getting more and more that uh, lawyers have figured out that if the person is not qualified to testify, you can knock them out without arguing about methodology and getting down into the scientific weeds with them. But lawyers, lawyers don't like science. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, they, if they like science, they'd become doctors. What uh, what kind of training do you offer? I mean, you have a bunch of th things here, and uh, but what what is the focus for you on the uh, you know on your training? Well, it's there's two different kinds. Um, I, I give a, a half a day or a full day on how to survive a reliability challenge. Uh, what you need to know in order to survive that challenge in terms of knowledge. Um, and I, I'm teaching one at the end of this month to, to uh, ATF. And I just I tell them, this is what I'm going to look at when I look at your report. And I want to see that you know your stuff. You know, if you know your stuff, I'm not going to bother you. I may help the lawyer cross-examine you, but I'm not going to come into trial and testify that you're wrong if you're right. But here are the different ways that you can go wrong. And then the other uh, course that I offer, I, I'll go through the whole book uh, over three days and uh, go do a deep dive into the book chapter by chapter. So, and that's what I'm, I'm doing one in North Dakota in September. I'm doing one in Vero beach in October. Uh, I've, I've given that three day course about a dozen times. Okay. What about, uh, are you still involved in research or working with any uh, students, academics, or and doing any, or groups, organizations, doing any of that still? 
I correspond with students doing research all the time. Uh, they just send me an email and I say, hey, you know, can you help me with this or that? And I say, sure, just don't plagiarize stuff. Or, and, or if you do, at least give me credit. Uh, <laughs> and I'm on uh, a couple of advisory boards. Uh, I work for the Texas Fire Marshal, uh, who once they got a new fire marshal, he, he hired me to uh, <clears throat> be on a science advisory work group. And we, we go through old reports um, that the fire marshals have written and we uh, critique their uh, photographs and their reasoning, get them to explain. And I've been doing that since uh, 2016 anyway. And their reports have gotten way better just because partly because they know that there's a chance that this report is going to get reviewed by a bunch of guys that are going to criticize them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if they do a good job, uh, there's, there's going to be stuff that could use improvement. A couple of weeks ago, I, I, uh, I did an interview with Chris Fabrican. Are, are you still, are you working with the innocence project at all? Yeah. 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 I, I get innocence project cases all the time. Okay. Okay. And so, uh, and so what's next for you? Uh, I mean, you, you have, uh, accumulated this, uh, entire career and training and all this other stuff. Um, have you any other plans going forward? You know, I thought I would stop taking cases by the time I got this. Age, but <laughs> not yet. I mean, it, the, the work keeps rolling in. Um, there's, there's still people making mistakes. Um, and lawyers have figured out that going to trial without an expert, in an arson case is ineffective. And there's, there's actually some court cases that have said that. Uh, if, look, you, you need to consult with an expert. This is not stuff that you learned in law school and not stuff that you can just wing it. Now, I mean, a lot of lawyers think they can just wing it. You know, I'll, I'll just cross-examine the guy and the jury will not believe him anymore. Eh, right, right. It doesn't work so well. So, <laughs> you know, it used to be people would call me up and they say, John, I really need help. And I really don't have any money. Uh, we work for free. Uh, but after um, about 10 years ago, that the courts have started to understand that you have to fund experts mm -hmm. for the defense. So yeah, that's yeah. mostly what I'm doing these days. Um, I'm working on cases where uh, somebody is accused of arson, either criminally or in a civil case. And um, people want to hire me to, to, to help them avoid being ineffective. You know, Three out of four times, I'll look at a case, uh, particularly a criminal case, and say, you know, this guy looks good for it. Uh, yeah, yes, it is a, an intentionally set fire, and yes, your guy looks good for it. And believe it or not, defense lawyers are happy to hear that. Um, you know, they, they can negotiate the best deal for their client. Right. You that's know, true. That, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, at least they know where they stand, right? That's the important yes. thing. And that's, that's why they call me. Um, cause I'm going to tell them, you know, any, any expert that tells lawyers what they want to hear every time, uh, isn't going to last very long. Right. Right. So John, if somebody wants to get a hold of you, um, just is through the website fine. I noticed that you got a contact form here. I'm not sure if you're, are you online, like on LinkedIn and stuff like that or no? Yeah, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Facebook. I got the, this website. If you go to that website, you'll get the contact information. Just give me a call. Excellent. All right. Well, look, we're getting on in time. Um, I've, I've abused your time enough and a wealth of information. Uh, you obviously have a, a long history in this area, um, really good cases. And uh, I just want to thank you for your time. I really appreciate you uh, talking to us today. All right. My pleasure. All right. All the best, John. Thank you so much. Bye -bye.